Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today I am Dr. Clark for the next two minutes. Uh, and so uh, let me introduce you to Dr. Kirby Cundiff. He is a retirement strategist and portfolio analyst, as well as an adjunct professor of accounting and financial management at the University of Maryland Global Campus. Uh, Dr. Cundiff received his uh, BS in physics from Truman State, mostly in this building. Um, last year's in the building. Yeah. Okay. Started Science Hall. They moved us all over here. All right. Uh, and then he has an MS and PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, as well as an MS in finance. Uh, Dr. Cundiff held research positions at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and the University of Missouri Research Reactor in Columbia, Missouri. He formerly served as the chair of uh, accounting and financial management for the Graduate School of the University of Maryland Global System, or excuse me, Global Campus, the chair of the Division of Business Administration at the Rochester Institute of Technology, Dubai, and the director of financial planning programs at Northeastern State University as finance program coordinator. Oh, and is a uh, finance uh, program coordinator at Park University. And he is a chartered financial analyst, that's what CFA stands for, and certified financial planner. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Hunda. So obviously I've drifted from career path to career path. I got a PhD at University of Illinois. The job market wasn't that great and I was always interested in business, which over to finance which was pretty common at that point in time. A lot of my colleagues ended up on Wall Street. And this talk um, was originally, actually I did a statistics class when I was a uh, chair in Dubai. And back then you could easily access all these wonderful things online uh, that are now behind pay sites, including uh, temperature data, which was free through weather.com. So I had a stats class where we analyzed a lot of it. And this presentation in its original form was given in uh, Tbilisi, Georgia, just south of the Soviet Union as one of a couple of key, uh, keynote addresses, but obviously that's been a few years. Updated at some from 2013. Well, pretty much all the information he put forth. Um, I did my undergraduate again at Truman. I started taking classes here when I was in high school and then only spent, I guess, three years as an undergrad. Uh, we started in Science Hall, and I think this building may have just been built then. So the last year, 86, 87, I took physics classes here. I don't think any of the science people are still over here, are they? We moved them all back. And then went to Rice University for a year and then transferred to the University of Illinois, where graduate programs take forever and spent about a decade there on a PhD and a master's in finance. And then had a lot of academic positions since then. Okay. So I am probably not going to take the same position on many issues that you are getting in this class from other information sources. Um, I'll go through at least my perception and a lot of the scientists that I knew at the University of Illinois' perception on issues like climate change which is not terribly consistent with what you would see when the news media are getting a lot of other areas. So the one thing that is definitely consistent with, I guess, um, the ideas behind the climate change being a problem is CO2 levels have increased by around 50% since the 50s. That is probably man-made. A lot of people argue whether or not that's a good thing or not, whether they're bad thing. So carbon dioxide is only a very small fraction of the Earth's atmosphere. It's only 0.04%, so it's tiny. Totally and the fact that it's increased by 50%, therefore, isn't all that noticeable. Uh, besides what I saw on CNN and Al Jazeera, um, natural disasters have not increased in recent years or over the last 100 years. There's no real evidence for that. So no hurricanes, no extra things burning, no tornadoes. And a lot of biology people, maybe you can ask your biology professor if you got one, think that increasing CO2 is actually a good thing because it encourages plant growth. And if we go way back in time, uh, millions of years ago, um, when Earth first developed, well, the first thing to develop were plants. 
And at that point in time, most of the atmosphere was CO2. Plants overpopulated, and they produce a pollutant known as oxygen. And they produce so much pollutant that carbon dioxide went from, I don't know, 90% to whatever it is to a very low level. So if you run a commercial greenhouse and you want stuff to grow quicker, you inject CO2 in it, and it makes the plants grow better. And some of the early studies of climate change, um, particularly a physicist named Freeman Dyson, who was dying in his 90s at Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Study, where Einstein was, his conclusion was, yep, CO2 is going up as well. He obviously disagreed with a lot that's been crushed. Uh, global average surface temperatures are actually very difficult to measure. So at least the um, so-called official stuff, or they've increased by around a percent Fahrenheit since 1880. And one of the real problems is how do you even measure this? So if I wanted to know the average temperature of this room over the last year, could I get that within one degree Fahrenheit? First class you take in physics here, if you do a lab, is error analysis. How tall are you? Six feet, plus or minus an inch, plus or minus a millimeter. How well do you know it? And of course, the uncertainties in this measurement, if you try and do the entire planet, are huge. So the ability to measure that is very uncertain. So the thing, other thing that would support, I guess, climate change being a problem are computer scientists. So I've got a good friend at LSU, went to grad school with. Um, they do simulations, try and predict what's going to happen in the future. And a lot of those models predict all the problems they discuss. Of course, they've also predicted them for the last 30 or 40 years. They haven't taken place, and they'll argue why that is or not. So basically, the pro CO2 is a problem argument are it's gone up. Computer models say this will be a problem in the future. The stuff you see today, uh, natural disasters, and those sort of things, really doesn't work very well with actual statistics. And here is an example of that. This is by uh, Dr. Roy Spencer, who is a satellite temperature experimentalist expert at one of the universities in Alabama. And he falls also in the climate skeptic category. So he put together the number of U.S. landfalling major hurricanes by decades since the 1850s. And it looks like they peaked out around 1940 to 1950. Uh, there hasn't really been a trend since the 1850s, and they've gone down since then. So there's all this stuff on the news right now. I just watched Al, Al Jazeera this morning, picked up that habit in the Middle East, about you know, how the hurricane in Florida is caused by climate change. There would seem to be a lot of support for that. And if anybody has questions at any time, feel free to just yell at me. So I like informal classes. Now, they do the, do the distinction on this of landfalling major hurricanes. And he did that due to probably measurement issues. So you can imagine going back to the 1850s. Well, radar was developed during World War II. Weather satellites were developed in the 1970s, so our ability to get measurements has increased drastically over time. If you go back to 1850, and a hurricane went down and hit Nicaragua, or just uh, spun around out in the Atlantic Ocean, probably we wouldn't even know about it. There wouldn't be any measurements. that. So you can go to the official sites and pick down graphs that look more like this. It certainly shows more hurricanes now than in the 1850s. And maybe since the 30s, although that's questionable. But again, this can very much be measurement error. Maybe a ship vanished in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean due to the hurricane. Nobody knows why. So that's hurricanes. How about tornadoes? Here's a graph directly from the National Weather Service. It's on their webpage. I just downloaded it. And tornadoes picked out. This only goes back to the 50s, but looks like they peaked in the 70s. So tornadoes are not going up. Again, you can probably find graphs if you include weak tornadoes rather than just strong tornadoes that might have an upward trend. 
And again, you could ask the question if a really weak tornado hits some farmer's land back in the 1950s before radar or satellites, would we have a record of it? So certainly there's no indication that strong winds have gone up. If anything, then again, why that? No evidence for that one. How about all of the burn in land that we're discussing out in California and the West that's supposedly the climate change? Well, if you look, I guess, compared to the 80s, yeah, you can get an upward trend. Might be due to uh, things like they haven't cleaned out the brush in California in decades, so you've got a lot of underbrush that can burn. But if we go back before the 1950s, it's a fraction of the forest area that was burning back in the 20s, 30s, 40s. No upward trend there. This one doesn't go back as far, but obviously insurance companies are concerned about this. If you had an increase in natural disasters, hurricanes, et cetera, it can cause them to go bankrupt. So how do we measure that? You could look at disaster losses as a proportion of world economy. That not look like there's much of a trend since the 1990s. So hurricanes are bad. They lose a lot of money, but again, at least over the last 30 years, no trend in disaster losses. So back in the early days of the internet, or at least the earlier days of the internet, when we had access to free data, I downloaded it for, I think, um, multiple data points in each state in the United States. And of course, I looked at Kirksville. So here are the number of July record highs in Kirksville, Missouri as a function of decade. Um, your parents probably weren't alive then, but one of my dad's earliest memories um, our grandparents' farm in Coffee, Missouri, west of here near Maryville, he can remember um, his grandfather cutting down trees so the cattle could eat the leaves because all the grass was dead and there was basically nothing here. So 30s, Great Depression, Dust Bowl, you had basically all the record highs throughout Missouri, Oklahoma, the Midwest. I don't know if they still cover that when you talk about Great Depression era stuff. And well, not much since then. If we look at January, yeah, there's more support for that. Maybe we've got milder winters. It looks like the number of January record highs peaked in the 50s. And certainly when I was young, there was a lot more snow than there is now. So I can believe that one. And it's gone up since then. How about January record lows? Well, there's a little bit more support in that. Again, when I was young in the 70s, I remember we had a big snow in April. They canceled all the classes throughout Kirksville for a week. And, well, okay. So maybe you got a trend going to cold in the 70s and not much cold since then. Possible. Dr. Condis? Record lows. Well, there is more support in that. We certainly haven't had many record lows recently. Dr. Condis? Huh? I remember back in those 70s when we had that big April snow and they uh -huh. canceled all the public schools. Guess what school didn't get canceled? I assume Truman. That is true. That was back <laughs> in the day when Truman did not cancel for snow days. So you made everybody, at least in the dorms, walk, and those of us who were locals even back then would have to get across town. Yeah. <laughs> do, do they still have that tradition? Have you canceled any classes here due to weather recently? Um, we did cancel classes uh, five years ago, and I think it was seven years ago. But since COVID, and we have so much more Zoom capability, uh, the new policy is we're not ever going to cancel again. Okay. I guess that remains to be seen, but it's actually not a new policy. It's the old policy revisited, but there we go. Very good. So here is a, Another graph, this one gets a lot of attention where they say that we have the record high temperature every single year. 
Um, so I mentioned earlier about measuring the temperature of the classroom. Um, what goes into something like that is we've got to take thermometers all over the world. We've got to pick out which ones to use. And we've got to think that their accuracy is within the total change here. Um, so the absolute total change is about 1.2 degrees centigrade. So you double that for Fahrenheit, roughly a little over two degrees Fahrenheit. So do you think we can accurately measure the temperature change in the world within two degrees Fahrenheit? Is it most of that measurement done by satellite, though? No. Now, again, satellites have only had since the 1970s. So there's other uh, graphs for satellite data, but the purpose of these things were to determine, I guess, in modern times, when you go to the airport, you wear a coat, right? They're not designed scientific instruments yet. Don't the error bars count for that error? They're supposed to, and I picked this one out because I was happy that it actually had error bars, but there's going to be a lot of things that don't fall into that. Okay. Yeah. And when I was younger and started looking at this data, it showed what I would expect it to show. Well, the 1930s was really hot. And they have altered over the years the, the thermometers that you stick into this. And strangely, the 30s have gone away, and this has gone up. So arguments for that, I think they tried to claim most of the thermometers are, of course, in the United States and Europe. And they would claim, OK, maybe it was hot here, but it was cool in Africa. So they'd include most of those, more of those thermometers. <clears throat> um, the way the air bars are all done on this, I'm not actually even sure how they came up with it. I think it was some sort of a standard deviation within the data set that they used. So, but, you know, OK, possible. So we could say maybe we have a degree C over 150 years. I'll go on and question the accuracy of that more, and then I'll also compare it to historical changes during things like ice ages and see if it's even relevant. So that temperature increase is shown along this dotted line. And this is temperature increase is a tiny percentage of typical annual temperature. So you can't really even notice it's going up. And here's one of the big questions with it. Uh, when I was presenting this to Kiwanis, I attempted to go to the Crystal Airport and get an actual picture of our official thermometer. And they said I was a threat to national security and wouldn't let me out there, even after I called them on the phone and they said, sure. So, OK. Um, but over time, these thermometers at one point were sitting out in fields. Since then, we've built concrete around them. So you do definitely have warming in cities. It's called the heat island effect. Cities are warmer than countryside. And here you have one, and it can be sitting right by a window, right by an air conditioning or refrigeration unit. The effects of this is going to be pretty drastic. Again, these are not scientific instruments. They were not designed to accurately measure temperature. So what really is the error with it? And you've got thousands of them all over the world. How do you average them together? And you can do try and do a little standard deviation of that. If you do do a standard deviation of that and you get those kind of error bars, are you taking into account stuff like this? And at times they've claimed they have, and they've isolated and pulled out ones they consider to be a problem. But if we're going back to the 1860s, or I guess it was 1880s, do you really know that? There has been a small effort to actually create scientific temperature weather stations, but it's only been done since around 2005. And these are isolated. They're away from air conditioning units. They're out in fields. They're largely in North America. There aren't very many of them. They haven't shown any trend. Not a lot of them. And the people that would argue against that would say, OK, they're just in North America. Maybe there's warming in Africa or Southeast Asia. But yeah, they'll argue that this isn't valid. 
one of the more pathetic responses I saw to this. This was a response from somebody who did believe more in the climate change stuff that was analyzing that data and basically claiming it did show a warming trend because it did show an average increase of 0.86 degrees Fahrenheit per decade, it's about 15 years. But he actually stuck in the air bars to show that zero is within the air bars. So there actually was no statistically significant. And this is, you know, better analysis, obviously, than you're going to get through most of the news media. So that's recent data, the thermometer data. The stuff that goes back even farther is more speculative than that, with the exception of the satellite data. So satellites probably are better, although Roy Spencer, the guy that's the expert on them, he'll talk about, well, depends on the level of the satellite. Um, the satellites drift from place to place, that affects temperatures too. But I'd still trust the 70s satellite data more than anything else, but what does that give you? So the first weather satellite was in the 70s. There weren't a lot of them. We got a lot more today. It's not very long term. Um, if we go back half a million years, we have ice core data. If you've watched, and maybe you did for this, um, Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, there's a lot of time on the ice core data. That's actually a good argument against man-made climate change. And then there's other things like tree rings. We got 2,000 years of trees. We can try and get a proxy for temperature out of how much they grow, but it's also going to be influenced by how much rain there is. And there's even more bizarre stuff, boreholes, cave sediment, coral growth, lake sediment, and they try and put all this stuff together. So again, Earth's atmosphere has almost no carbon dioxide. It's tiny mainly nitrogen, and then the pollutant from the plant's point of view known as oxygen. So this is the ice core data. And at the point this was published, the CO2 concentration had gone up above any time recorded in the ice core data before. Now, obviously, when plants dominated the world, it was more than half a million years. So the argument would be CO2 has gone way up. CO2 is greenhouse gas. Temperatures should go up through greenhouse gas. And we see through half a million years, the red line, which is CO2, is correlated with the blue lines, which are temperature variation. And again, there's all these proxies that we'll briefly discuss of how you get this out of the I squared data. So our temperature variation from an ice age to a modern warming period, which we live in, is around 10 degrees centigrade. It's massive. And there's variations of several degrees centigrade within warming periods. So these variations are much larger than even what is assumed to be the CO2 driven climate change for the temperature data since 1880. So the scales are much larger for natural variation. And I think we'll all agree that humans were not influencing temperature 150,000 years ago. And of course the real problem for mankind would be these time periods. Um, I'm not sure about right here in Kurtzville, but Champaign-Urbana was covered with ice during the ice age. And there were very few areas that would have been habitable by comparison. Basically, everybody would start to death. You'd all flee to the equatorial regions. And you can see that these warming periods that we live in are pretty brief. So you got a lot of ice age, very little warming period. They do seem to be cyclical. There are various theories about what causes that, solar cycles, um, rotational cycles, but we really don't know what causes ice ages. But we do know they don't last very long, so 
you go back to the 70s, there were movies like Soylent Green that talked about global warming already then, but there were also speculations of already going into new ice ages at the risk. Was there a question or anything? Or just talking? Oh, no, we're good. No problem. So Al Gore makes a big deal about this and there being a correlation between CO2 and temperature, and there definitely is. Um, he doesn't really make an argument of how what caused CO2 to go up and caused temperature to go up before humans were around. And if you talk to a chemist, he will come up with a different idea for you. If you heat the oceans, they can absorb less CO2 and therefore they emit CO2. So the cause and effect relationship is exactly the opposite. We don't know why ice ages end, but when they do end, temperatures go up, the oceans warm, they emit CO2. And the way you get these ice cores is you drill them down in Antarctica, they're very deep, and you can measure different layers. And they estimate there is an 800 year difference between when temperature goes up and CO2 goes up. So the cause and effect relationship is first temperature, then CO2. Kind of confused by the term temperature variation. Is mm -hmm. that just like the general like global trend or like the difference between like the winters and the summers? So this would, uh, yeah, this wouldn't be able to even measure a summer versus a winter. Okay. So since you're going on scales of 100,000 years, what they do is they drill these big ice cores and they, again, all this stuff is a proxy. You can't directly go to an ice core and it's not going to have a temperature readout on it, right? So you got to come up with something. And how do they come up with it? They say the measurement of the gas composition is direct, trapped in deep ice cores are tiny bubbles of ancient air, which we can extract and analyze. And they look at the measurement of temperature, it comes from the ratio of O16 to O18 are from the ratio of one hydrogen to two hydrogen, because we know what, if we heat air to a given temperature, we know what that ratio will be. Now, how accurate is this going to be? Man, there's, there's air bars and all this stuff. They're probably pretty bad. But at least we can see what goes on now, and we can extrapolate into the past. And that's about the best they can come up with. And you do come up with, obviously, scales on the order of 10 degrees C difference. And I think the first guy that told me about this was my chemistry professor when I was here at Truman by the name of Gordon Frankie. And obviously look up the stuff and people have done the ice core data and they've came, done regression analysis, you come up with an 800 year lag. And this is another paper. And I think somebody pointed out to me correctly, I got the wrong reference on the wrong paper. So I think this goes to the same, same data set. I think the one that goes with this has a black and a white picture, but they do have basically an 880 year lag between temperature going up and CO2 going up. Okay. So what one of you guys mentioned, the satellite data. Um, Roy Spencer, the guy that put up the other stuff, is one of the satellite experts, and this is his stuff. So you do show some warming in satellite data. It only goes back, it looks like, to 1979. Try and get a variation in trend line. Um, I think we had El Nino's or whatever in 98. That obviously put a peak. We do have a higher peak here and he tries to put air bars on it. So how much of a temperature increase? Looks like they got half a degree C. Okay. And maybe that's within the air bars of the satellite data. Is that something meaningful or not? Probably not. Different people will have different opinions. How about record high and low data? 
Well, the highest temperature ever recorded was in 1913 in Death Valley, California of 134 degrees Fahrenheit. So to my knowledge and to what I could find online, we've never found anything above that. And not surprising, the Soviet Union may be the coldest place on earth at certain times of the year. And that one was in 83 at minus 89 degrees C. And it's nice they put in California. Science people in the audience. So if humans aren't the dominant influence on temperature, what else could be? Well, where does all the heat of the earth come from? The sun. And I did my doctoral dissertation on the transport of the stellar interior, which is basically the atmospheric science of the sun. So I did some of the studies, similar things that they try and do with the earth and apply to the sun. So it has a lot of cycles. The best known is the 22 year solar cycle where you have sunspots. And then there's some sort of a 70 year cycle we don't understand. And there may be longer cycles we don't understand. And the 22 year one is caused by a magnetic field winding. Basically the magnetic field of the sun sort of winds up getting tighter and tighter, like you would wind a string on a top and then it bursts through and then the whole process starts again. And probably the earth does something of the same thing, but it's gonna be a way longer you know, 10,000 year cycle versus a 10 year cycle. So this is an effort to study Back to the 1850s, what data do we have? But they try and claim they have data from particularly, I think, the Chinese. Total solar irradiance versus maximum temperature. Obviously, there's going to be some really big air bars. Yeah, 1850s. Yeah, sorry, I was confusing that. So, no, we do have some data back to the 1850s. And, well, it does show basically solar radiation increases around the 30s when we have a dust bowl in the Great Depression. Goes down around the 70s when I remember the cold winters, and so does Elizabeth, and comes back up now. So there may be some sort of a solar cycle we don't really understand that may influence things a lot more than humans do. Another thing that is constantly brought up is glaciers melting and glaciers on melting. So here we have the South Iceland glaciers that I picked out as an example. And the top, they have air temperatures measured around the glaciers, sea temperatures measured around the glaciers, and here we have milk rates at the bottom. Notice there are no milk rates between 75 and 2005. That's because the glaciers were actually expanding during that time period. So we do have melting quite a bit of it recently. But again, we also did back in the 30s. So it's a cycle. And one of the things they have noticed, particularly in Greenland, the glaciers are retreating in Greenland. And what do you see after the glaciers retreat in Greenland? You see Viking settlements that were under the ice from the Middle Ages. So, yep, they're melting, but clearly it was warmer, at least in Greenland and in um, England, because they actually raised wine in England in the Middle Ages than it is now. What about computer data? Um, the computer models have been running since the 70s. We're getting faster and faster supercomputers. One of my friends runs the, or is the associate director of the site at LSU. And these have been predicting temperature increases that even play with the data just haven't taken place. Now, their response to this is saying, OK, the CO2 hasn't gone up as much as we thought it would due to limits, possibly. But so far, at least, the computer data that hasn't predicted huge amount or hasn't that is predicting huge amounts of temperature increases it's still due today and that model of course is based on the co2 causing a greenhouse effect and causing temperature to go up versus the opposite possible model of temperature going up causing co2 to go up 
And there are some responses to that, and the responses are, well, both can be true. Well, initially, the temperature will cause CO2 to go up, but then when you feedback about the maybe the CO2 will more temperature go up. So the computer scientists are far more likely, I guess, to believe in man-made climate change than the experimentalists that look at all that, all the experimental data. Which brings us to all of these things that you hear on TV. Like 99% of scientists believe that man-made climate change is a problem. So where did those surveys come from? It's mainly quoted by politicians, but that is a survey by Cook et al. that is shown up here on the red dotted lines. There are a bunch of other studies that are showing on the green dotted line. Now, they probably do show a majority of scientists fall into that camp today. I don't think they did when I was in grad school. But this also leaves out the majority of research papers which don't take a position on this. So the most climate study pages would say, we don't know. And if you include that, and if you look at the same place that I found this, this red dotted line goes down to something like this. So the vast majority of papers are going to be normal scientists. We're studying it. We don't know. We don't know everything, which is probably the best scientific approach. Saying you know something is pretty. What is the bottom axis? The bottom axis is the number of references. So this one would certainly have more references, but they also picked out particular journals. So they picked out journals that basically you would have to be defined as a climate scientist, and a climate scientist is defined as somebody who believes in and a global warming to publish. So certainly we do have more references here. I guess that's one thing I didn't see. 10,000 versus these being 2,000. And these would be more specific journals versus more general journals. So oh, that's an argument. And now we get to the real political stuff. So when I was in graduate school, I worked at the University of Illinois and I had my office in the Frederick Seitz Research Laboratory. So Fred was very famous. He left the University of Illinois, uh, been very successful. He was chairman of the National Academy of Sciences. And he was one of the guys that developed the technology that led to the MRI machine. So U of I is really known for solid state physics. And I think at that point in time, he may have been president of Rockefeller University since he was a big climate denier. Uh, the name Rockefeller is associated with oil and he was attacked for that. Um, I was at the University of Illinois during the 100th year in the physics department. And they invited, they invited back all the Nobel laureates that had been there. Uh, John Bardeen, who was the only physicist to win two Nobel Prizes, one for developing the transistor at Bell Labs, and one for superconductivity. He had died before then, but all of his students that he developed superconductivity with came back. Uh, Fred Seitz came back, a bunch of other people came back, and they had a whole series of colloquium by all these guys. And Fred made a big presentation because he was very irritated on the politicization of science with climate change. And particularly what he was irritated about was this guy, William Happer, had worked in the Department of Energy as I think, an undersecretary. And Al Gore didn't like him because he supported and granted, sent basically Department of Energy grants to scientists that questioned Al Gore's ideas. So Al Gore fired him. And Fred made a big deal of, OK, this is the politicization of science. And then Fred got together with Ed Teller, also dead now. I did get the opportunity to meet all these guys, who was the guy that designed the US hydrogen bomb at Los Alamos. And these two people are basically the two guys that started what we would now call the climate denial movement. So I will toggle back and forth. 
they started putting together and passed out everybody a petition. This is the web page is still up, basically, of scientists that don't believe this is a problem. And at this point in time, they have about 31,000 signatures. I think we were just required to have a bachelor's in it, so it had 9,000 PhDs. And this is Ed Teller, the guy that was on the hydrogen bombs signature. Ed is a reasonably political guy. He also supported uh, Ronald Reagan's um, Star Wars program. And he's a really, well, he's dead now, but he was a really, really smart person, but most people thought he was hard to get along with. So he got um, uh, another famous scientist, the guy that was the head of Los Alamos Security Advanced Report. Over, uh, I guess, support he thought for the Soviet Union. So there were a lot of, there is still a lot of politics in science. So those guys are all dead now, but a lot of the other ones here are still around. Um, these are people that basically don't believe this is an issue. I mentioned Freeman Dyson, who just died last summer. Michael Crichton, who um, Harvard MD author, he was probably one of the more famous popular people on this, the guy that did Jurassic Park, among other books. He published a book, uh, State of Fear, on the climate change stuff. The guy that founded the Weather Channel occasionally. He's sold it out since then, but he looked at lots of weather data. He obviously believes this is an issue. And then we've got some interesting people that are actually on the IPCC. So the IPCC is the United Nations group that studies this. Most of the people that would be in the climate denial category have been kicked off that or quit. A bunch of them threw a fit. The way that the, that system works, of course, the scientists get together and they do an analysis. And then they send it to the politicians, and the politicians do an analysis, a science analysis. And there was a time period that a bunch of the scientists thought the politicians took what they said and twisted it and made it incorrect. And of course, even what you see from the UN is far more mild than what we'll see on NPR or CNN. They do make scientific statements that are a lot bigger. Um, but there's still a few of these guys around, and one of them is at the University of Missouri Columbia, Andy Lupo. I've seen him talk a couple of times. He spends a lot of time talking about even if CO2 is a greenhouse gas, there's only a tiny amount of frequencies that aren't covered by the biggest greenhouse gas, water vapor, that CO2 would influence. So there really isn't even a lot of opportunity for CO2 to affect temperature. Other people on this, a couple of Nobel laureates, um, one in physics, I think he's still alive. Kerry Mullis, I think, just died, Nobel laureate in chemistry. Um, Fred Singer, Roy Spencer, I mentioned. Willie Soon of the Harvard Smithsonian Institute. I think he's tried to challenge Al Gore to debates multiple times, has refused. And then I put some people I know here from Truman, one of my friends from, you know, when I was this tall and drove up the street from me. Um, Alan James, got a BS in chemistry here. He's now a professor at Columbia College. My former chemistry professor and uh, Stephen Salt, who is a former biology professor here. So, Dr. Condiff, uh -huh. just to be clear, yep. you've noted that Edward Teller is Truman connected. Do you want to talk oh, a little bit more about that? Is that President Truman or Truman State? Um, I've got Ed Teller above the Truman connected list. To my knowledge, Ed Teller is not Truman connected. Okay, I didn't understand your heading there. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, that probably isn't very good. I'm trying to say Truman connected is with three people below it. Got it. So Ed Teller spoke at U of I a couple of times when I was there. And um, when I was at Los Alamos, I remember one time going into a restaurant and Ed Teller was there, and um, Hans Bethe, who was the guy that first figured out that the sun is um, basically powered by hydrogen fusion. And of course, by then, both of these guys were in their probably even 80s back then. But it was the kind of place you would run into a lot of Nobel Prize winning people and you know, well, well known scientists that nobody else would probably know about. And my advisor in grad school was named Gordon Bain, and his office mate was um, the guy who basically found it, or designed, got the Nobel Prize for both uh, the transistor and uh, superconductivity. But 
To my knowledge, she never made any comments on climate change. Do you also classify yourself as a skeptic? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. That that should yeah probably be obvious from all the stuff I put through. But. You haven't really presented anything on the other side, though. Mostly just denials. I'm a little. Yeah, I guess I don't. From a scientific point of view. The only stuff I know of that I can really put on the other side is yes, humans have increased CO2. And we have computer models that say that will be a problem. But I actually don't know really anything else that would support that position. Now, there are certainly environmental problems in the world. I think back in the 70s, what Lake Erie started on fire. Um, even when my parents were young in Kirksville, they used coal burning in their homes. He had soot in Kirksville. So I believe those issues exist. I don't see a whole lot of support for this. I think a really big issue that gets blamed on climate change is droughts. Mm -hmm. We've had, to my knowledge, increase in droughts. And I guess other than the fire thing, I don't know the graph of how you would define that. I certainly would say, obviously, the United States in the 30s had far more severe droughts than anything we've seen since then. You had all the people fleeing to California, et cetera, because there was no food here and all the farms basically dried up. Now they blame that in Oklahoma somewhat on farming practices, but at the same time, all those record temperatures was just burning everything up and you can't blame that on farming practices. So there could be places around the world that's true. It certainly wasn't true here. Burnt data going back to the, I believe, the 2030s. Um, so I won't be certain of that old data, I suppose, because it shows you know a large sea trend in the 2030s. How can we be certain of that when we can't be certain of other older data? So I guess it would depend on the kind of data. Um, I would think, of course, records would get better as time passes. I believe you already did have a U.S. Forest Service back in the 20s. That was established by Roosevelt. So that would have been, do you know what year exactly it was? Or? Look it up. Yeah, look it up. I'm just saying that if we can't trust data from that time period in general, we might have played more years or so. It could be questionable. It was found in 1905. Well, I guess which do you think would be more likely to happen? We would, if we can't trust past data, we would not have records of things burning, or we would have more records of things burning. So it seems likely that you would have things burning, you wouldn't have a record of it fast, right? So the There's probably several factors that go into this. For one, we've probably gotten better at fighting fires. Yes. Sure. There is also probably less forest to be burned. Um, I guess that would depend on how it was defined. There's actually more trees in the U.S. than there were then, because if you look at Kansas and all these places that used to be grassland. I, don't know, I was thinking in terms of think population growth. Forest service. I'm sure our population is multiplied like four times over yeah. since you know the 20s, 30s, where that's the highest, yeah, that which was... I would imagine means you're taking up more land. Yeah, that, that would certainly be true, and certainly the ability, my guess is a lot of this is probably back then, you didn't have helicopters to go fight fires. So that's certainly true. And that's going to bias this, but I'm not sure what it means if you bias it. Um, for years, they have fought fires, and that's resulted in all this underbrush growing, but now when it burns, it burns more, which is probably somewhat responsible for that. Other than saying you definitely don't have an upward trend, I don't know. And I don't know how you would measure drought. Certainly, if you measure drought by food production or something like that, we're a lot better at producing food. Is there another question back in the back? Not distressing? So I guess on the trying to you know put what I know about the being in science, I tended to know a lot more 
And bizarrely, at the University of Illinois, which is certainly a very democratic place, when I was in graduate school, none of the scientists spoke about this issue. I'm sure if you go back now, all the people I knew were dead, and it was a different circumstance. Leonardo DiCaprio was sit here. Well, I'm trying to think of, I put uh, basically, certainly the guy that created Jurassic Park. So who is there popular that believes in it? That's really out there pushing it. I didn't put Greta Thornburg, but I put up some people. So I've got three scientists. These are the big names I know of. Um, politician, popular people, and of course the biggest pusher is the United Nations. So I don't know of any major scientists to put up that are actually researchers in the area beyond this. They're certainly out there, but these are the ones that have been in the news. And from my scientific experience, I know a lot about the other guys because I've met them. I've never met any of these guys. I don't know if your textbook mentions any particular scientists or not. One of the things I find annoying is most of the kind of stuff on this never mentions actual scientists. They say, believe the scientists. Okay, we're scientists. So the UN has been pushing this for a long time. The UN obviously wants more regulatory control worldwide. They want a worldwide tax system. Um, they would like carbon credits. Before that, they have pushed on a tax on all international currency exchange. And they also wanted to tax countries based on their military. So they're they're looking for a tax base since right now the way the UN gets money is the US gives it to them and obviously the US a lot of times doesn't give it to them even though they the same even though the US is there. Al Gore is the biggest senator pushing this. Obviously, you know, I'm looking back over decades. There's certainly a lot more people today. Um, do people have a financial incentive for this? Absolutely. Al Gore is worth $300 million. And he made most of it on these sort of issues. So that puts in a bias, just like obviously the Bush administration pushing for war in Iraq. There probably were no weapons of mass destruction. A lot of Cheney's buddies in the military industrial complex made a lot of money on that. So follow the money, there's certainly incentives. Uh, James Hansen, NASA, Bill Jones. Um, the political stuff again, I know Michael Mann. I'll study some of his stuff, and there was the so called climate gate emails between a bunch of these guys. So I can keep talking, or I may be about out of time. Um, this is the famous hockey stick data. Uh, Michael Mann produced this. There are two different data sets here, and they've merged them. So the red is the temperature data. And the black stuff comes from a mixture of tree rings, corals, ice cores, and historical records. This goes back the last thousand years. So he claims the temperature skyrocketed. And that got a lot of press. The other guy I mentioned, Roy Spencer, put together the same data and got this. That was how do you merge two different data sets? Now, what do I know? I know around this time period, you could grow wine in Great Britain. And I know that around this area, the Vikings were occupying Greenland and it wasn't covered with ice. So which am I more likely to believe? And the climate date stuff was basically these guys sending emails back and forth where they called this a trick of putting the two data sets together. So this is quotes from chairman of the IPCC from 2002 to 2015 at the UN. And he says things like protecting the planet is in my religion. I might note he has less of a background in science related to this than I do. So the guy ran all this stuff. He was ran out in 15, I think, in a Me Too type sex scandal. So you don't necessarily have the most knowledgeable people. I obviously haven't kept up on the science that much since I'm like basically a financial manager now, but you don't necessarily have the most top people. 
So advantages of this kind of technology. We've been burning oil since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. If you go back before this, we all died pretty young. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have anything but wood heating. Um, probably George Washington, the richest man at the beginning of the United States, lived at a standard of living below the Romans. He didn't have running water, didn't have hot baths, certainly didn't have automobiles. So technology has increased standard of living. We've doubled our lifespan. You know, fossil fuels, another kind of thing. I find that a proving positive. And the alternatives are expensive. So cost of electricity in Denmark, which is the country with the greatest amount of renewable energy, well, that's quite a bit more expensive than the United States. Of course, the cheapest energy in the world is places like China that are still building coal, coal power plants and still have a lot of smog problems. So if you're good. And I do, if anybody is that interested in it, I've got a, a video recording of the same topic on a YouTube channel, you can search under my name, many years ago. Any other questions I haven't addressed? I'm certainly probably biased on the other side, but then I assume you get a lot of bias on a different side than me for the rest of the class, that's right? Thank you, Dr. Cundiff. Thanks, Elizabeth. Anybody have any questions? Now is your time. That's most questions I had. Yeah. Sure. CO2 doesn't really take out the temperature, but like CO2 is a greenhouse gas and a lot of this temperature rises. So is your argument primarily that it's just not quite enough of an increase that humans have caused? It, it's certainly a greenhouse gas. I guess historically, again, that it seems temperature has driven CO2. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, but it seems like it's a pretty mild one. So the major greenhouse gas is water vapor. And that's what keeps most of the heat in the atmosphere. And what uh, Tony Lupo kept talking about quite a bit, you can look at the frequencies that are blocked by water vapor. And the ones that CO2 blocks, there's a few of them, but they're very small compared to the ones blocked by water vapor. So I'm sure it has some effect, but I'm not sure how measurable it is. Well, methane, you know? I've, I've seen graphs with methane increase on it. I haven't really looked at that issue. Is it stronger than CO2? Most of the more complex carbons are. Okay. Yeah. So why do they concentrate so much on CO2? You think that? Just because it's the most common one. Just treat the methane's technology. It's probably very easy to measure CO2 at the moment, comparatively. So if CO2 is only 0.04 percent of the atmosphere, you know what methane is. I guess if anybody wants to get a hold of me on this, I think I've got a few business cards with me. You're welcome to grab one. Or just catch me through that web page. I think I've got a whole lot of them. All right. Any other questions? Thank you again for your time.